Allah So the, the title of the conference, Healing Humanity, Lessons from Islam, um, we tend to think about lessons from Islam as simply lessons from history. But the question is, how do we understand our role in all of that? How do we understand the role of our religion today? Essentially, how do we understand the principles of our Sharia as sacred principles for human development? How do we understand and wrap our heads around so much of the tragedies happening around the world today and tragedies happen here locally? And what is our role in understanding what our role really is? And the reason why I think it's so important is because it's tied to the notion that Sharia is fundamentally an important and necessary component of human development. And what I'm going to try to do in the next 19 minutes and three seconds is really wrap our heads around how do we understand something that we think is so distant and far, but so needed and so essential today. But before I begin, I want to ask us a simple question. Can I be a proud, patriotic, Sharia practicing Muslim? Can I be a proud, patriotic, Sharia practicing American Muslim? Can I really be this? Are there any contradictions? Because we can't move further if we believe that there are inherent contradictions, that I can't be Sharia practicing and be an American Muslim today. Because what does it mean to be proud? What does it mean, for example, that I'm from New Jersey, the Garden State, or that I have a sense of school pride, or for example, that my heritage is Egyptian? Now, these are minor things, but they're important. But what does it mean to be proud of Islam, proud to be Muslim? and to understand what it means to live imbibe with this pride because that there's something that I can offer to heal the ills of humanity today. To understand that we should have a sense of honor, a sense of izzah, a sense of karama, that we are Muslims. This is an obligatory pride. Alhamdulillah, We thank Allah who's guided us because if we're not for him, we would not be guided. We would not understand that there's some sacred principle for humanity imbibed in our faith that we have so much to offer, but if only we understood what it was. And so the reason why I want to focus on this is because historically, and even in the way we study Islam, we study as separate, as Sharia is separate. And when we think about Sharia or the principles of our faith and healing humanity as two separate things, that we, as enlightened Muslims in the West, are going for the first time to put in dialogue with one another, then essentially what we're doing is we're reifying the fact that our faith is so separate from how we understand humanity and its ills. That concepts like peace and environmentalism and human rights and democracy and business ethics are all Western intellectual constructs that we as Muslims in the West are going to scratch our head and say, what does Islam say about that? As if Islam had not theorized all of this already. And so to look at these as fundamentally separate, some things that are distinct, when we insist that things like the essence of our faith or our Sharia is fundamentally separate, things that are separate can be easily traded out. You can find another system of principles and substitute that for the things that guide you every day and that your healing for humanity comes from some other Western intellectual construct and it remains there because we've traded out what our faith is really about. And so this is what I wanna talk about because fundamentally we have been defining ourselves by what we are not instead of defining ourselves by what we are and what we fundamentally have to offer. And so I want us to begin to deconstruct the assumption that these are indeed separate and that we are putting them together in dialogue for the first time because we for the first time want to say, humanity is hurting and I think we have something to offer. And so let's begin. When we think about the measurement of ethics, in Islam, it's fundamentally altogether different. We don't wait for a problem to arise and then set to find some kind of normative answer. And I'm gonna go back to this at the end of my talk, inshallah, to address some critical things happening right now in our communities. In Islam, there's a constant set of principles and they come from the maqasid of our sharia. The purpose of ethics in Islam, ethical principles, and they're very simple. 
The purpose of our principles or our ethics are justice, freedom, the common good or maslaha, alignment with human nature, and the preservation of human life for both Muslim and non-Muslim, of honor and of dignity and of preservation of faith. I, I really want us to wrap a head around the ethical principles that guide our faith, our justice, freedom, the common good or maslaha, alignment with human nature, and the preservation of human life for Muslims and non-Muslims, and of honor and of dignity and the preservation of faith. And these are simple human principles, but their implementation could be altogether different. And there's a golden rule to what's be, to be considered as part of this. And the golden rule is, does whatever we do uphold justice or adl? Does it uphold mercy or rahmah? Does it uphold the common good or maslaha? And does it uphold wisdom? Brothers and sisters, imagine if that's how we taught our kids our faith that our faith was, a, faith was a system of ethical principles, that this is what guides everything we do, and if we actually understood it, then the problems facing humanity, the title of our conference today, we can actually begin to theorize answers and solutions. And that any ruling that does not abide by justice, mercy, the common good, and wisdom is actually against our sharia. And so when we think about what this really means and how does it translate in our everyday life, you know, at the university, I have students who want to enter the most cutting edge scientific and social science fields because today, that's where the money is. Think about this. You cannot, in Islam, enter a business that harms the environment, that the increasing pollution and devastation of our forests and our wetlands, that the creation of PBAs and plastics that now are in our airs, that we live in an ocean time period where the bodies of oceans are full of plastic and the rate of cancer and diabetes and obesity and if that affect the reproductive health of both men and women that lead to chromosomal abnormalities. All of these biological components that we now find in everything that we want to do in the biomechanical engineering of our food and our waters is all against Sharia. That you can't enter a business that creates something that deviates from the natural order. So another group of my students is intent on studying genetically modified grains, right? How can we create crops that produce, how can we create seeds that produce crops that are immune to all the environmental disasters that are happening, but yet, yet render land unarable after a few, a few seasons? That we cannot enter into business that creates products that deviate from the natural order. And the crisis fe facing the world today in terms of food scarcity is tied to that fundamental problem. That our faith says this is against our sharia. That you can't enter into a business that requires abusive workers to succeed. Low wages, breaking up of unions, all of this is against our faith and our sharia. And even though the largest and tallest buildings are going up today in the most holiest of lands of our faith, that this is against our sharia. You can't enter into deceptive practices. The financial crisis of 2008 that hit the world because of our deceptive practices created on Wall Street, all of this is against our faith. And if here's a small, just bit of, of factual information, Muslims in America are known as the most economically stable religious minority group. What does that mean? The 2008 economic crisis did not hit our community. Why? Because we are not allowed to enter into unethical business practices. And so I want us to think about the principles of our faith do what? They not just preserve us, they're meant to preserve all of humanity. But if only we actually articulate it into the ways with which we think, what are we doing here with our lives? And it's fundamentally tied to how Islam sees humanity. Islam says that no matter who, no matter what you are, no matter where you are, every person possesses human dignity. No matter how lost and confused, human dignity and integrity exists. And it's our job to actually look for those who need it most and preserve it for them, no matter what. And so when we speak about ethics in Islam, we're working with the assumption that these are constants guaranteed by no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And so here's where I come to my last point, where I really want to think about what does this mean for us? Not just what we th do with our lives, but how do we understand the social problems around us? So years ago, when, just until last year, when this conference was held in Baltimore, so in 2015, right around exactly this time, April 12th, right before the conference, in Baltimore, Maryland, a young man by the name of Freddie Gray died in police custody. Now, what do we know about Freddie Gray? He grew up in a home where the buildings were laden with lead paint, against the norm, against our Sharia. The education system that he was a part of was the worst in the country. That was against our Sharia. The social and economic isolation of the inner city where he came from, highly segregated against our Sharia. The dehumanization practices of the police. Freddie Gray was not the first person to get a rough ride in the back of that police van that led to his death. The demonization practices that deny even prisoners their humanity is against our Sharia. The abject poverty in Baltimore. 88% of the residents of Baltimore are affected by poverty. That's against our Sharia. Among the poor children in Baltimore, only 4% are able to go to college. When we think about children who go from K through 12 to enter college, in the area Freddie Gray was from, only 4% were going to go to college. And we think that college is the gateway to the middle class, the gateway to upward, upward mobility. But for the vast majority of the people that live around Freddie Gray, it's completely impossible. The academic challenges of broken schools and political challenges of those that live outside of those schools and challenges that don't wage on just most middle class youth, but all of those challenges of the everyday lived experience of everyone in the inner city of Baltimore, the people that we would walk past even to go to the convention center, the people we drove past on 10th Street to get here today, all of that is against our Sharia. The fact that the United States has become the most incarcerated country in the world is against our Sharia. That from 1980 until 2008, the number of incarcerated persons in this country went from 500,000 to 2.3 million. That today the US has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners because our for-profit prison industrial complex is making money by keeping people in jail that African Americans are incarcerated at the rate of six times more than the average white man, that 58 to 60 percent of all prisoners are African American, that one in three black men in this country go to prison in the United States, no matter what. And it's not because they're more aggressive, it's because they're black. And we think about what all this means, all of this, brothers and sisters, is against our Sharia. I remember when I, first, when I, when I left teaching in New Jersey and went to Brooklyn, and I went to do a project at a youth detention center. And I went in and very naively, you know, I have a young son, and this was a youth detention center. And these children were convicted of really violent crimes, but they're too young to go to Rikers. And very naively, I put my hand on this young boy's shoulder, and I said, son, to, to say a sentence. And he, um, he, he cringed. And I, like he recoiled and I, I took my hand off his shoulder, this little boy, the age of my son. And the director said, don't touch the kids. They have no concept of affection and love. They're here for the rest of their lives. Brothers and sisters, this exists in our communities. When I think about the events of Baltimore, of 2015 and how this has continued to be part of everyday life and how we feel so disconnected, the question becomes is, if we're really going to be healing humanity, are we really ready to ask ourselves, are we going to address the social, political, and economic ills of the world today? The fact that we're sitting in a beautiful convention center, staying at hotels, means we are a privileged community. Tomorrow I'll talk about Islamophobia. But today, we recognize that we're a privileged community, that we have so much to offer. And I don't mean economically privileged. I know that we are pri privileged because we understand that we're here for a different purpose. Our purpose is not simply the accumulation of wealth. Our 
purpose is simply not the accumulation of degrees and of achieving some kind of worldly levels of success. The reason why we're privileged is, is because we understand that life as a Muslim is so much more than the everyday. And yet today, if you think about it, those ethical principles that come from our Sharia, more than two dozen states in the United States have attempted to pass anti-Sharia legislation. And the purpose of the anti-Sharia movement, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow, is actually not to get people the, to get the laws passed. It's actually to get people afraid of this thing called Sharia. But more so because Islamophobia is about internalizing it, that Muslims internally believe it. It's to get you and I to believe that there's something wrong with our faith so we don't practice those ethical principles, that we don't think that our moral mandate says that it's not about living the everyday life, but it's about what am I going to do for my neighbor? What am I going to do for my community? That I'm going to move away from the modern aspect of individualism and I'm actually going to put my community and my family and my ummah above all else. That is the challenge. When we think about what the goal of every Muslim is today in terms of achieving peace, in Islam, peace occurs in two dimensions. The inner peace, or in Arabic, tamanina, to get to the nafs al mutwa'inna, the internal peace. And this is what motivates what we do. And we strive for peace of the mind and of the soul and of the body. And the second dimension is that understanding of external peace and what is that all about. Now together, internal peace and external peace of society, of culture, of civilization, are really supposed to form this thing called peace on earth. But how do we get there? So during the turn of the millennium, I worked at the United Nations. I worked on nuclear disarmament. And we had just had a really bad decade. The 1990s, not only did we have the end of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall and Tiananmen Square, but we also had Bosnia and Rwanda and Somalia and another war. And we had this moment where the mid to late 1990s were so full of ethnic violence that the, at the United Nations, they decided to come up with millennium development goals. What's the next millennium going to look like? And at that time during the UN Millennium Summit, the then Secretary General Kofi Annan said that there's two major things plaguing the world. That if we really want to get to peace, we need to get rid of these two things. The first is hunger. The second is fear. Uncertainty about the future. The feeling that you're not, you're not certain about your security. Brothers and sisters, hunger and fear are worse today than they were decades ago. Today, especially because of war and famine, there are more people hungry than ever before. Every, 20, every three, two to three seconds, someone dies in the world from hunger. And in terms of fear, fear, the uncertainty, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Can I feed my kids? Will a bomb fall on me? Will I be disappeared? Do I live under an authoritarian regime? Fear is at an all-time high. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us at the end of Surah Quraysh? What favors does Allah bestow? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمُهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنْهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ because Allah gives food to eat and security and peace of mind from fear in society. These are in integral portions of how we understand peace. And who are they bestowed upon? Those that really take healing humanity seriously. If you want to attain peace through your identity, through who you are as a Muslim, you have to ask yourself, why am I really here? What am I doing? What does it mean to be a Muslim? inner peace, that life in service, generates that outer, outer peace. And inner peace is satiated by living a life in service of others, and it's not a life in service to those that look like you and I. It's really living a life in service to this community. When we need to rethink about what we're doing with our lives, practically speaking, young Muslims today should be the ones that lead the efforts for talking about the victims of wars all over the world in Rwanda and Ethiopia and Darfur and in Yemen and in Syria and in Kashmir. Really advocating for those that live in poverty in New Jersey where I am, in Newark and South Plainfield and in Camden. 
painting a house, feeding your homeless doesn't happen on occasions. This is how we live a life in service. And what about the environmental efforts? We should be the ones leading them for our humanity. Because if we don't, in 12 years, our kids are not going to inherit a an earth that lives, looks anything like ours. And that's just in 12 years. When we generally we begin to think about justice for all, about the, all the social ills and what we can offer, this is really what life's all about. And I'll conclude with this. Imam Ghazali, in his letter to his beloved son, says, Ilm without amal. Doing, knowing without doing is the equivalent of knowing nothing at all. Brothers and sisters, I know there are more degrees per capita in our community than any other. But the question is, what are we doing to actually think seriously about healing humanity? I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards all of your efforts and places you on a path that will give you gratitude in this life, but also pleasure in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I've said anything of benefit, it's only by the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All errors are my own. Thank you so much.